welcome to the CEC report for the 27th of May 2016. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is Robert Barwick. Welcome Robert. Thanks Elisa. And on today's show, dairy crisis is free market madness. Parity pricing now. And who really stuffed up the Sydney siege response? So firstly, dairy crisis is free market madness. Parity pricing now. Now, everyone would have heard about the dairy crisis that's hitting Australia right now. Uh, it's a terrible crisis for dairy farmers. The prices have been slashed down to around the 14 cent mark. We've had numerous suicides even in the last couple of weeks. It's increasing dramatically. Even Coles has felt the need to reduce, uh, sorry, to increase the price of their dollar a litre milk to a dollar twenty. Their farmers brand in yeah, order to raise money, which who knows if it'll it's even get to the farmers. It's a public but relations exercise by Coles, but it does actually acknowledge that the low price of milk is a problem. Exactly. Um, there's a government support package which is in the offing, but which basically amounts to more debt because. The loans to the farmers are essentially going to go straight to the processors, such as Murray Goulburn and Fonterra. And the farmers don't want more debt. You know, they're well, they're exactly. all loaded up with debt. Exactly. But what the money will essentially be used for is to pay back the processors because, and we'll talk a bit later about what actually caused this situation, uh, but the processors have forced the dairy farmers to accept a 15% pay cut backdated to last July. So essentially when they get this money, these loans, it'll go straight to pay that. So the farmers won't really see a cent of it. Uh, and this is because the dairy processors have to meet profits that were pledged to outside investors. And as I said, we'll talk about that more uh, very soon. Now, farmers rallied around Australia in regard to this crisis during the week and Craig Isherwood, the CC leader, together with our candidate for the Mallee region in Victoria, Chris Lay, went along to support a farmers rally. In, they went to the Melbourne rally this week and to promote in particular the CC's solution of parity prices, supporting a minimum uh, price for the farmers that will cover their costs of production. And we're going to watch a clip of Craig and Chris uh, at that rally. Yes, we're here today in uh, Burke Street supporting the Dairy Farmers Rally. Hundreds of dairy farmers, as you can see from behind us, have rallied here in Melbourne in support of scrapping the terrible uh, conditions that have just been foisted upon them, namely the, the price of milk dropping to 14 cents a litre, a thing called clawback, which was never supposed to happen. Many uh, dairy farmers are totally shocked by this because it basically has thrown them out in the street in literal terms. We've just heard that up to 14 dairy farmers already in the last two weeks have committed suicide. Now I'm joined here with Chris, uh, by Chris Lay from up in the uh, Mildura region. Chris, what do you have to say about this? Well, Craig, up in uh, the uh, electorate of Mallee there, which I'm running as a candidate for uh, in the uh, federal city of Mallee, we've, uh, we've got a number of dairy farmers and I've spoken to them, uh, quite a few of them, in the last uh, week or two since this, this whole thing has just exploded. And uh, I, I find it almost un, un, unfathomable to, to, to believe that this clawback is even legal, let alone a moral uh, judgment upon the, the milk industry, uh, upon the de their supplies. So what we're seeing, Craig, is um, a very steep drop in milk prices, but not only that, uh, particularly if you're a Murray Goulburn supplier, um, the uh, processor is actually asking uh, for a, uh, a payback from uh, the introduction of an of a opening milk price. Yeah. I cannot believe they're doing this. Unbelievable. I mean, yes. the fact is that they paid the farmers a reasonable price, not a good price, several over the last the course of the last year now they're saying oh we can't afford to pay you that therefore you have to pay us that money back that's right Craig that's, that's exactly what's happening and uh, we're seeing farmers with uh, that are already cash strapped uh, having to burden uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in in clawback as, as, as it's now called uh, and uh, some of them have literally no hope and clearly what, what has to happen here is we, we need to uh, do away with fair trade uh, free trade agreements Th these are the uh, 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 what uh, putting our farmers uh, at this type, type of peril. Yes, Chris, I mean, we've, we've been handing out the new Citizen yep. and the new uh, flyer that we produced talking about the need to return to parity pricing. Yes, now, that's this right, is Craig. something 28 years ago when I co-found the CEC was one of the key issues to pay farmers what they actually need, what their, what their produce is worth. Now, parity pricing 
means that farmers can then get the income that they need to fund themselves. They don't need the handouts that Barnaby Joyce has just given, $500 million handout, more loans. It's merely a Band-Aid, Craig. It's merely a Band-Aid. And the recognition of that particular idea is very, very uh, high. Parity pricing is something that people respond to straight away here, I've noticed. Uh, but it's a political problem, Chris. Absolutely, Craig. And, and this is this this goes far deeper than just what we're seeing here today with with uh, with uh, drop of milk prices. We we need a legislation change or, or just scrapping of the national competition policy and and just starting again and and, and getting back to to uh, what really needs to be done, Craig. And I look I, if I recall back, and I am a former dairy farmer uh, back when we did have some uh, semblance of parity pricing pre-deregulation where we had a fixed price we had security and that was all disbanded under deregulation and now it's gone from bad to absolutely catastrophic I, I can't imagine being a dairy farmer in this situation now yeah well, that's right Chris I mean the parity pricing is not something new it was done during the Roosevelt years in the United States right, where Craig, under yes. wartime conditions mm -hmm. they mandated that people farmers be paid what they produced and it had a tremendous boost for the economy because farmers then became able to pay for the rest of the inputs to the economy that's what we're calling for and that's the solution here that's no right. more band-aids and no. that's why you're standing for the seat up there in, uh, in the Mallee absolutely Craig that's that's exactly what I'll represent with I, I, look these band-aids are going to help but they it's not the solution uh, and and I, I I will uh, fight for the the, uh, the constituents of Mallee, particularly those farmers and dairy farmers up along our northern border of the of the seat of Mallee, uh, and we, we're going to fight this together. Uh, all your dairy farmers out there. And I think, uh, Chris, the best thing for people to do is to get onto our website, have a look at our website yes. and see the policies that we represent. They're all up there. They are. There's a profile of who you are, so yes. they don't have to <laughs> see a, a mysterious man just talking to a microphone. That's right. But you're, we're, we're exceptionally well known on this subject. And, uh, you know, at this particular point of time, people need to educate themselves as to what the solution. Can I also throw out one good idea? Yes, As people, our CEC's reporters Australia-wide should stop buying $1 and $3 milk. Absolutely. Buy great. the branded product and send a message back to the supermarkets that we are not going to buy the product that's causing the problems for the farmers. That's right, Craig. And uh, look, that's what I've been advising uh, people who, who who speak to me when I when I talk to this in, gen, in, in the general public about what can we do. I said, well, you know, even though the, the fresh milk market, the daily market, is a small portion, it's a very evident one. And I and I've said, just sack the one dollar milk, go in there and buy buy your cooperative milk, pay the few extra bucks, and and, and, and send the message. Leave the one dollar milk on the shelf. Leave it on the shelf, Craig. Let it go. Let it, let let it go sour. That's right, that's right. Okay, Chris, well, we better uh, sign off now. Thanks, and, Craig. Uh, thanks for talking to the CEC report, and we'll no talk worries. to you again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so, Robbie, can you say a little bit more, though, about parity pricing in particular? Well, that's what Chris and Craig were discussing in the video, and it's, it's some other people might have heard of this idea of a floor price. Um, parity pricing is better than a floor price. Floor price is a set price. Parity pricing is the idea that um, uh, the cost that a farmer gets, and we're calling it for, for more than just um, dairy, it should be for all agriculture because it's, that's our food supply, right? So the cost that a farmer gets should not f ever fall below the cost of production um, because then they're going to go broke if that's what happens. And of course, that's, that's not, this is not the first time this has happened in the agriculture sector. And the precedent for this is what happened in the United States during World War II, started just before World War II, and then it lasted until the 1950s, where they based it on a formula. Um, and so it can fluctuate. It's a flexible thing, parity pricing, but it was based on a system that no one could rort, but it just made sure that the farmers got their, their um, costs covered. Now, of course, that's, it's a, it is a minimum, and therefore, if there's a good season and prices go up, the farmers can benefit from that, but they're not going to be wiped out if there's a bad season. And it worked. And what was particularly striking about it in the operation in the United States is when it was in place, um, it was so successful, farmers stopped borrowing money, mm. right? And, and, you know, for financing their crops or whatever, they didn't need to. They, could, they had enough income to finance their on-farm activities. And it, I, uh, lawfully, therefore, it was in the, in the 1950s when the US Congress scrapped it. They scrapped it because the banks mm. lobbied them to scrap it because they didn't like, like not having the situation where they had regular customers mm. among the farmers. And that era though, for the 40s and the 50s, was called the golden era of our US agriculture. And so it works. Get away from the free market mentality, which we'll talk about after the break. Um, 
if you, you can solve problems like this by having such a scheme as parity pricing. Yeah, because no doubt the free marketeers uh, do not like the idea of such government intervention to make sure of something as straightforward as the cost being covered. So we'll come back to that after the break. You've been watching the CEC Report, the weekly TV show of the Citizens Electoral Council of Australia. What can people do to find out more, Robert? Well, they can get on our website, www.cecaust.com.au, or they can call our toll-free number, Lisa, to order a copy of this, the Australian Alert Service, which is our weekly publication where we write up all the material we use. That number is 1-800-636-432. Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're discussing the dairy crisis. Now returning to the issue of the way the government are handling this with their assistance package of low interest loans and so forth, uh, I just wanted to put out some of the commentary that we're hearing about this. Uh, for instance, two of Australia's leading economists were quoted in media this week, Bruce Chapman and John Freeban. And I'll just tell you what they had to say. Freeban talked about the fact that this gives selective uh, assistance to just one industry while the rest miss out and that it would give inefficient farmers the opportunity to put their snouts in the trough, that's a quote, while their more efficient competitors were ineligible to get the same assistance. Uh, he also said that farmers all have plans to get through the hard times but quote, what happens though is the farmers want to socialise their losses and privatise their profits. So in the good times, yeah. it's all well and good, but in the bad times, they want help. Uh, and Bruce Chapman said, uh, they used to say Australia rides on the sheep's back, but it's not true because agriculture only accounts for 2% to 3% of GDP. Okay, that may be true, but why is it the case? Isn't it the, the case that the free trade ideology and all these um, deregulation and so forth, the genders have wiped out our agriculture? Exactly. So if, if agriculture is 2 to 3% of GDP, I'll tell you what's not. Financial services is now 10% of GDP. It's the fastest growing sector of the economy in the last 20 years, thanks to things like the superannuation industry. And this term, socialising losses and privatising gains, that economist, who I'm trying to constrain myself a little yeah. so, so I don't swear, that economist knows well and good that that term came about because of what happened to the banks on Wall Street in London and in Australia in 2008. They did that. The government did that for the banks. These economists don't compare it to the banks. What's the difference between the banks and the farmers? Hmm. Well, the banks don't feed us. The farmers feed us. And we're it's particularly, we're talking about there's different types of food, right? So maybe, um, I don't know, someone who grows... Uh, avocados, as much as I love them, I think they're important, right? But, you know, is they're probably slightly less important than a milk producer, mm. right? Which is a staple in everyone's diet, right? All our kids need it, etc. Grain, etc. Yeah, you know, these are the, it's, it, and it's, you know, this is, this is an important part of the agriculture sector. So I'm not, I'm not saying avocado is not important. It's all important. But this is our food supply and some of the staples are the most important part of the food supply. Um, and we're talking about them as pigs with their snouts in the trough because we're trying, they're in this crisis that's where they're suiciding, etc. and they should be safe. So this, this really gets me going because what these free marketers, these free market advocates have actually done is they try and make out that, that somehow when you don't have a free market, the people that benefit, like the industries that benefit, they're, they're living off the public teat. The opposite is true. When you, have, when you don't have a free market, what it does, it doesn't lock out the producers and the consumers. It locks out the predators. It locks out the speculators. It locks out 21-year-old kids with a maths degree who work for Goldman Sachs in New York City who are on a million dollars a year because they can manipulate prices on a screen that bankrupts Farmers in Australia and in Canada and in Africa like that. That's what it locks out. So these people, they're the pigs. These economists, they are the mm, pigs. Mm -hmm. And people should get angry at them. 
Don't just don't just go to the Parliament House protesters. Go to these universities if they're putting up with yeah, if they've got free market this, economists. This locked economist in there. needs to spend a week on a dairy farm, I think. No, but and by the way, dairy farmers get up at four a.m. in the morning <laughs> to do this for us. It's right? not easy work. But the the post nineteen eighty three economic consensus. This is what brought this about. Can you explain what that is? Well, I want to put up on the screen. We've got a, a table that that shows you the uh, number of dairy farms in Australia mm -hmm. um, since nineteen eighty. I think it is, and you can see that we've gone from about twenty thousand down to six thousand now. And the sharpest drop was after two thousand when they deregulated the dairy industry. But basically, in nineteen eighty three, Hawke and Keating got elected on. Um, you know, as a Labor government, but they were secretly in collusion. And that's what it was with John Howard and the people, John Hewson, and these guys had set up this thing called the Campbell Committee, which plotted the total radical deregulation and privatisation of Australia. And in this particular instance, in 1991, Keating set up the National Competition Policy. He got a guy named Fred Hilmer, who was an executive from Macquarie Bank, to review Australia's domestic economy. And Fred Hilmer went through and said, we're going we're gonna to take out every little bit of protectionism in the domestic economy for everything, industries and, and things like the statutory marketing boards, but, but just even other things like all, a lot of local governments were, were affected by this because, for instance, um, they, had to, they had to adopt what was called compulsory competitive tendering. So no longer if you were Dubbo, could you automatically get a local, a, your local industries in Dubbo to supply the local government's needs. You had to put up for tender mm. so that a Sydney corporation or a multinational corporation could come in and underbid the local producers. And that just wreaked havoc through the industry in Australia. Um, so that's, that's what national competition policy was. It was used to deregulate dairy in 2000. What's the end result though? This is called national competition policy. Mm. The end result is less competitors. Yeah. You've gone from 20,000 farmers down to 6,000 farmers. You've gone from you know, dozens of processors down to, you know, the, the, these particular farmers have two options, you know, um, Murray Goulburn and Fonterra. That's, you've got a duopoly, Coles Woolies, that before this started had hardly any of the power that they've got now, right? And now they're just um, all dominant and they, they, they give farmers take it or leave it prices and it's just ripped through the system. Um, and what it's done is put all these middlemen between the producers mm. and the consumers who just get to extract their profit. Mm. They're the ones with the pigs in the trough that these free market economists are defending. And the processes like Murray Goulburn, I mean, they were they started off as co-ops, right? So what happened there where they were forced to float on the stock well, market? Well, they're in the, so they're in this free market jungle and they're in, they're in manipulated markets and therefore they're looking for margins all the time, right? And what we noticed that the boards of Murray Goulburn and Fonterra both are dominated by bankers. Mm. And they come up with schemes, oh, let's have a float on the market. So now they're not just a co-op anymore. They've got a section that's, that's, that they've got unit holders on the share markets that they're now obligated to. And um, uh, the people who, the chief executive, you know, he got $10 million for this. So here the farmer's getting 40 cents a litre while the chief executive's getting $10 million. He walks away with $10 million. And these are all, the, and the whole thing has ended in tears but these are the kinds of schemes that people come up with in a free market system, mm. right? When at the end of the day, we're talking about a, pr a process that pr that's supposed to pr produce food and supply it to mm. us who can eat it. But instead it's become beholden to producing profit and when they don't, it has to come out of the dairy yep. farmer's hide as we're seeing with what they're call, calling clawback now. Um, so I'll get off my high horse, but don't <laughs> believe the arguments and the theories of free market economists mm. They are lies. Yep, and you haven't already. If you haven't already called into the CC, call in. We'll send you a copy of the latest alert service. It's got an excellent article by our national chairman Anne Lawler on this whole dairy industry scandal. So we'll stop there, and after the break, we're going to talk about the Lint siege. Welcome back to the CC report. Who really stuffed up the Sydney siege response? Now the uh, Sydney siege inquest is ongoing at the moment and one of the things that's been reported through the course of this week is that the negotiation leader had not even read the profiles of man Haron Monis and therefore really didn't know what he was dealing with. Now just to preface it first, our interest in this is our ongoing fight against international terrorism and exposing its true source. And of course this Sydney siege was painted 
as being done by ISIS and so forth from the get-go before they even really knew what it was in order to justify our ongoing involvement in foreign wars and also further terrorist laws and, and fascist laws against the general population. Um, now, we've had breakthroughs in this campaign, which we've reported recently in terms of the fact that the uh, investigation report into the 9-11 um, inquiry has been getting some progress and some traction in terms of the release of the missing 28 pages of that report. And there's an update on that, which is the fact that this JASTA bill, which is the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, passed uh, the Congress unanimously on the 17th of May, the Senate, I the should Senate. say, it still has to go through the House of Representatives, which will happen in the next couple of weeks, but it passed unanimously. Obama has threatened to veto it, but various um, of the Congress people are saying, look, we can get a veto, veto proof majority, yeah. which is a two thirds vote, and they're confident of that. Uh, but this is the bill that if it passed, the Saudis had threatened to withdraw $750 billion of their investments in US Treasury bonds. Uh, and in response to it, they actually put together a 104 page white paper, which they distributed to every congressman in the United States defending their position, uh, but which said nothing. It, it painted them as being the greatest ally of the United States in terms of fighting terrorism, but it never said anything about what they did prior to 9-11. But Robbie, tell us a bit more about how the Sydney siege intersects this and what's happening in the inquest this week. Okay, because what, what, why are they protecting the Saudis in this case? You know, there are top level people in the US protecting the Saudis. The, the, there's a spillover into the U UK where, where this um, goes into the Al Yamama arms deal between BAE Systems and the Saudi government, and that's that t when that was being investigated. Tony Blair shut that down, because what we're saying is terrorism is a strategy, right? It gets used to justify wars and justify fascist police states, and the people that use it as a strategy is our side. It's the U.S. government, it's the British government, it's the Australian government. They changed the world after 9/11. You know, no one, no one doubted. Oh, 9/11, terrible thing. The world's changed. But they're, they're trying to cover up who did it. Well, so in Australia, we've had a terrorist incident. We've had one, this guy, mm. right? We've had all these terrorist arrests recently where go and look at the wording of what they say on these guys getting charged with. They're getting charged with, you know, um, conspiring to acquire a thing that could be used to facilitate the um, arrangement of an event that may lead to a an undertaking by someone to go somewhere that might end up in a terrorist attack, mm. right? It's convoluted. That is the nature of these laws that were passed. They're so broad, they can grab anybody. And one young guy just got acquitted by a jury when they were presented the evidence and realised there's no evidence, mm -hmm. right? Just because he's got a, a, a Croatian or, a, you know, um, Bosnian sounding name and he's a Muslim. That's not enough evidence, sorry. Um, so anyway, this is, this is a problem. So you've got this one actual attack that was Man Haron Monas, and we've put out releases on this. We spoke to someone who knew Monas, Mamdou Habib, who has had his own experience with the Australian government on these things. And we regard this as not a terrorist attack at all. This is a guy who, the month before the Sydney siege, was cut off contact from his young sons, mm. right? All contact. That has, that has sent fathers over the edge all around the world. A guy shut down the Sydney Harbour Bridge over it. A guy held his sons hostage in Geelong for 12 hours over a similar thing. So that's what happened to Monas. This that what came out of this, the siege this week is the, lead, the, the negotiation leader, who is a hostage expert, but he's not a terrorism expert. He'd done one little course in Islamic, he called it Isla Islam 101. Yeah. That's all he knew. He did not read the profile that would have told him all this information about Monas. So that came out this week. What also came out this week is that one of the hostages, Selena Win Pei, sent, made, tried to make three phone calls after midnight at 12.30 a.m., 12.32 and 12.37 to the police and they were not answered. What the hell is going on here? Um, the, they were, the hostages were conveying requests from Monas that the police were ignoring. One of the hostages, Michaela, um, says, uh, look, Marsha Michaela says, we were just left there to, mm. you know, whatever was going to happen to us. Now, this is bad. This, the way this is handled is bad. All the, all the attention they released was going on to the police as a stuff up. I would maintain that the police did not make these decisions without um, advice from ASIO. 
And ASIO should be the one being called to answer here for this because they're the ones that have turned this into a big terrorist incident that mm. it probably wasn't. Yep, and find out more in our alert service. Thanks for tuning in to the CEC report. Thanks, Robert. And join us again next week for more. You've been watching the CEC Report, the weekly TV show of the Citizens Electoral Council of Australia. What can people do to find out more, Robert? Well, they can get on our website, www.cecaust.com.au, or they can call our toll-free number, Lisa, to order a copy of this, the Australian Alert Service, which is our weekly publication where we write up all the material we use. That number is 1-800-636-432.